Right where? I thank Mr. the answer, and I'd associate uh, him with what he says about the flooding. My constituency, as many of my colleagues, have been affected, and we're very appreciative of the work being done by the emergency services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, the block grant will need to be adjusted to take account of the revenue raising powers being devolved. But it's, ag but it's agreed by the Smith Commission the Scottish Government should not be financially disadvantaged by the transfer of the new powers. Uh, will the Minister uh, give us his views to what would be a fair indexation of the block grant? Grant adjustment. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A fair model of block grant adjustment will ensure that Scotland is no worse off financially as a result of the, trans as a result of the transfer of new powers. Does the Minister agree with the cross party view and that of Anton Muscatelli, Jim Cuthbert, and the STUC that only the model of index deduction per capita would oh, adequately yeah, yeah, yeah. deliver the principle of no detriment? Yeah. Yeah. Rayleigh really Whiteford. Yeah, yeah, a, good, yeah. a good new year to you, Mr. Speaker. I think many people will find it bizarre and frankly quite unacceptable that the Secretary of State for Scotland is not even attending the negotiations of Scotland's yeah, fiscal yeah, yeah, framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can the right honourable gentleman explain why his office as Secretary of State seems to have been deemed irrelevant to these critical <laughs> negotiations? And given he's not directly involved in the negotiations, can he share his personal view of whether he agrees with the learned professors and the STUC on the preferred model? Hey, Cowan. The model of index deduction for the adjustment of the block grant may result in the Scottish block grant falling substantially without consideration of the different rates of population growth north and south of the border. Does the Minister agree with me that this or any other model of block grant adjustment that results in a diminished Scottish budget year on year will not fulfil the Smith Commission's principle yeah, of no yeah. detriment? Yeah, yeah. Devin Newlands. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Smith Commission recommended that the cost of establishing the infrastructure for the collection of the newly devolved taxes would be a cost borne by the UK Government. Can the Minister, can the Secretary of State for Scotland and not the Deputy First Minister of Scotland confirm that the UK Government accepts those recommendations? Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I wonder if the uh, Secretary of State agrees with the First Minister, with Professor Muscatelli and with the STUC that more powers for Scotland cannot come at any price, that the fiscal framework settlement must deliver fairness for Scotland and will he commit to a date before the Scottish election by which an agreement must be reached? Yeah. Angus Robertson. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As Scotland is in a vital geostrategic location with the Iceland gap to our north, the Atlantic to our west, and the North Sea to our east. So, as the SNP has been pointing out for a long time, it has been negligent and dangerous for a maritime state like the UK not to have maritime patrol aircraft. So we welcome yeah. the recent U-turn by the government <laughs> in the procurement of uh, uh, Orion P-8 maritime patrol aircraft. Can the Minister confirm to the House when the entire fleet uh, will be operational? Mr. Angus Robertson. People note that the Minister was not able to answer the question of when will the entire fleet be operational, so perhaps when he comes back after my second question he, he will answer the first. Yeah. Uh, the, the RAF is currently maintaining its its skill base by training uh, on maritime patrol aircraft with the United States, with Canada, with Australia and New Zealand. So does the Minister acknowledge the importance of MPA training, which was scheduled to be based at RAF Kinloss before the scrapping of the Nimrod uh, fleet? Will the Government ensure that training for P-8 MPA uh, aircraft uh, is based at uh, RAF Lossiemouth, as it currently is for both uh, tornadoes and typhoon? Yeah. George Kerrivan. Mr Speaker, given that uh, employment in Scotland is now 53,000 higher than it was at pre-crisis, and given that output in Scotland is now 3% higher than at the pre-crisis, will the Secretary of State concur with Scottish business leaders that to oppose the savage cuts by the Treasury in the autumn statement to the UK's trade export agency? Ferrier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I recently asked by a written parliamentary question to the Secretary of State what discussions he had had with the Secretary of State for working pensions on the introduction of the new working health programme in Scotland. His answer was a masterful example in how not to answer, which is what we've seen today. 
Will he now take this opportunity to tell the House if he has bothered to discuss how this new programme will affect my constituents with the DWP? Wish Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the honourable gentleman from Christchurch knows, the Scottish Affairs Committee have been looking into higher education, specifically a post-study work scheme for Scotland. What the Secretary State will find is that everybody, that's the universities, the trade unions, the employers' association, want that scheme for Scotland. Will he now be a Secretary of State for Scotland and put that case to the Home Office? Mr Speaker, the health service uh, is devolved, but junior doctors in Scotland are not planning to strike next week. Why does the Prime Minister think that the Scottish Government has good relations with junior doctors and his government doesn't? Angus Robertson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Scottish Government has been investing record levels of funding in the NHS in Scotland and also works very hard to have the best possible relations with the doctors, the nurses and all of the NHS staff. Will the English Health Secretary speak to his Scottish colleague Shona Robertson to learn how to resolve the situation in England and stave off strike action which no one wants to see, least of all junior doctors? Deputy Speaker, and uh, Happy New Year. The apparent uh, tax credit uh, cut U-turn performed by the Chancellor in the autumn statement appeared at the time to be a victory for common sense and for the vigorous campaign fought by my colleagues on these benches and in Holyrood and indeed uh, by Labour, Plaid and the Greens. But in reality, as the uh, dust has settled on the much hyped uh, U-turn, it would appear now all the Chancellor did was delay the pain of those tax credit cuts and transfer much of them into universal credit, specifically at the work allowance. Indeed, the House of Commons library briefing on this issue states that the quote, work allowance reductions announced in the summer budget will ultimately have a similar impact to the changes to tax credit which are now not going ahead. So, low-income, working households in Airdrie and Shots and across these aisles are still going to suffer painful cuts from this austerity-obsessed government, and these low-income families are again going to be asked uh, to pay the price for economic failures not of their making. The cuts have, have, the cuts have, have just been de- deferred deflected and dished out by other means. So, yet again, we must ask how these cuts can possibly chime with the government's claim that they want to make work pay or with their aim of universal credit that uh, work pays and more work pays for everyone. Well, work will not pay for those on universal credit who are due to see their incomes cut by up to £3,000 a year, according to the House of Commons Library, £3,000 less for a single parent or a family before housing costs are considered uh, for where one or both adults are disabled. These people are working. They are working hard, they are paying their taxes and are now to be hammered yet again. Now, The Minister said in his uh, remarks that he wanted change to the cycle of taking money uh, from low-income workers and giving back through Social Security. He is achieving that change, but now the Treasury will just take and not give back. Now, the government benches may well suggest that this can be made up by working extra hours. Indeed, the Work and Pensions Secretary has already made this suggestion. But for those with a disability which makes it possible to work but impossible to work full-time, or for someone with caring responsibilities who can only work part-time, uh, or for those whose employer cannot afford to give them extra hours, this cut will be an unfair punishment for this government's flawed and reckless austerity at any cost obsession. This despicable suggestion that all those who are about to have their incomes cut can just pick up some overtime here and there just goes to show how desperately out of touch Tory government ministers and the evidence of uh, this uh, debate a great many of the government backbenches really are. They haven't got a clue how people on low incomes get by or nor how devastating an impact these cuts will have. If the government was serious about reducing welfare spending, Madam Deputy Speaker, it would be creating more job opportunities and truly dealing with barriers to employment, particularly for the disabled and mentally unwell. But instead, we see savage cuts to social security support directed at those finding it most difficult to get into work. The Universal Credit Work Allowance and the Employment Support Allowance Work Related Activity Group are perfect examples. These help those in need of extra support to either get back into or stay in work for varying reasons are both are being slashed to ribbons by this government. So I hope the government uh, will heed the call from my right honourable friend, the member for Bantham Buchan, from uh, her excellent speech and publish an impact assessment. 
And, uh, we must remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, that these cuts are being made out of choice, not necessity. The Tory Government should be refocusing its priorities for spending cuts elsewhere and not on poor and low income uh, families. So, in conclusion, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I hope we can see a similar rearguard action from the Tory uh, backbenchers which, who spoke out against the tax credit cuts. Again- Chris Stevens. Mr. Speaker, I give me year to year and all, <laughs> and money may you see. Here, here. Can I thank the uh, Labour Party and the member for Pontypridd for bringing this motion to the House? And I want to start, as he did, to discuss the parliamentary procedures and the concerns I had about how this change was made. Because my view is, is that the statutory instrument committee should be used to address technical. Uh, changes to legislation and technical amendments. This was not a technical amendment, Madam Deputy Speaker. This was a policy change and it was a procedural vehicle to sneak in the most damaging legislation and avoiding public scrutiny. What we were subjected to at the Statutory Instrument Committee from Government members was the usual sunshine and cheerful rhetoric. Uh, so much so that if you were playing Tory bus phrase bingo, you would have won the snowball after a couple of minutes. Because the reality of this change is that a lone parent who currently earns the national minimum wage can work up to 22 hours, but with this change to cut to working allowance, would lose that support after 12 hours. And there were many questions which I asked at the Statutory Instrument Committee, which I'm still waiting on the answer to, and I hope the Government front bench will take their time to uh, answer some of these questions. Firstly, what assessment has been made on the effect of the changes in working families and their ability to take on part time work? Mm -hmm. Does it disincentivise work and lead to workers reducing their hours? Because it seems to me it is human nature that if there is a chance of someone losing benefit payments and they can only save that, that benefit by cutting their working hours, that that is exactly what they will do. Will there be any mitigation on the effects on their benefits? How will carers be affected, and particularly young carers? Mm -hmm. And talking about young workers, what about those aged under 25 who will not get access to the national living wage? What impact assessment has been done, and I will ask this question again, on the staff in the Department of Working Pensions, who we know are the lowest paid civil servants in the country. So much so that when staff from Her Majesty's Revenues and Customs are merged into the Department of Working Pensions, staff who are working in HMRC earn £2,000 more than those who work in the Department of Work and Pensions. Staff who are subjected to a 1% pay cap, who are increasing and had to pay increased pension and national insurance contributions. 40% 40% of DWP staff currently on tax credits. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have heard so much today again about aspiration. What does a cut to working allowance mean uh, and what message does it send to those who aspire? Madam Deputy Speaker, the reality, I believe, is that people are increasingly aware that the ladder of social mobility is being systematically pulled up ahead of them and that no matter how hard they work, or how much they aspire for a better life for their children and themselves, they will be punished for not being born into the right sort of family. That is the reality of this cut to universal credit work allowance. 